So this patient's coming in for um, assessment of this swollen lesion on the back of his left tricep. It's hard to appreciate this in the video, but this is an area that's quite indurated. Indurated is the medical term we use for quite firm, and obviously it's coming to a puncta. This is clearly a localized abscess, and this is all inflammation secondary to infection that's underneath the skin that's wanting to come out. So we're gonna to have to incise into this, allow it to drain. As we talked about on other videos, the problem we'll get into with this is, once this becomes infected, the lidocaine, the local anesthetic that we use, works less effectively. So lidocaine works by being injected into a space where it's ionized, it becomes unionized and penetrates into the actual cell membrane. When this area becomes infected, it becomes more acidic, and the lidocaine is maintained in its ionized form and it can't get into the cell. So when it can't get in, it can't prevent nerve transmission. And so we end up having more infection and uh, more uh, pain receptors that are active than we would like otherwise. So this is just a topical antiseptic that we're putting on. This is chlorhexidine, which is the one that I prefer. Again, what I would tell you in these cases, this is clearly not gonna be a uh, sterile setting because we're gonna be opening this up and there's infection inside. But we certainly wanna be doing our very best to sort of uh, temper this. Now I have a resident working with me today, so I'm gonna be asking her some questions. We don't identify residents because it's a little bit stressful. Um, so here's, this is the lidocaine we're injecting now. You're gonna feel a little bit of a poke here. And what I want, I want to be very superficial and I want that to blanch, you okay? Mm-hmm. Because if we're gonna have any success with this taking, it's gonna be if I can actually knock out the superficial nerves that are there that we have to inject through or in size through more specifically. So you, if you had to list the bacteria types that are most likely causing this problem or most likely leading to infection, what would you guess they are? Staph aureus. Yeah, Staph aureus is number one. Um, Secondary. Probably like um, strep. Strep aureus, yeah. Mm -hmm. And staph aureus, what percentage of staph is MRSA, which is, and what does MRSA stand for? Um, it would be um, methicillin resistant. Right. Aureus. So methicillin is just a sub-branch of penicillin, so it just means it's not gonna be sensitive to penicillins if we use it. So, so what percentage of staph is gonna be MRSA? I'm gonna guess 20%. You're awfully close, it's about 10 to 15%. Okay. You okay? Are you talking to me? Yeah, you. Yeah, no, I'm dead. So our patient here is actually a nurse and a friend of mine, so he's... So if he wasn't a friend, I wouldn't freeze it up appropriately, but it's, it's <laughs> So when we talked about this the other day, we differentiate bacteria based on what staining mechanism? Just the gram positive versus gram negative. Gram staining, right? Yeah. And so that process just identifies them based on their cell layer. Mm -hmm. um, so what type of bacteria are these? Gram positive or gram negative? These are gram positive. Gram positive. Yeah. Does that hurt or does that feel uncomfortable when I do that? No. Nope. All right. So and here's here's a this is a more advanced question. So gram staining picks up on what layer within the cell? Do you remember what it what it picks up on? It's like the polysaccharide. Close peptidoglycan yeah. layer, yeah. right? And what's the actual stain they use? What is that? Uh, I couldn't tell you. It's crystal violet but that's, that's going back. That's all for the people who do microbiology. Definitely. So this is our number 11 blade. So you just want to incise that to the point of most fluctuance. You okay? Yep. Yeah, just bring that over. So this is what we expect. So this is all, just bring the garbage over the side, please. This is all purulence, which is dead cells. This is why this was causing so much pressure and discomfort. I'm just gonna push this up here. You okay? Mm-hmm. So you can get really large abscesses that can contain a real large amount of purulent material. Largest areas are down around the rectal and vaginal spaces. Ischial rectal abscesses can be massive and they'll pour out cups of purulent material. And the biggest issue when you're doing this as a resident or a student is just to be prepared for what's going to be coming out. So we have a whole bunch of four by four gauze here. 
And in cases where I'm doing bigger abscesses, you can see that. And so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm trying to push pockets in. I can feel that there's a pocket over here, and that's why that drains more. You okay? okay? And again, this is always somewhat uncomfortable for the patient. So this is why I tell you, if you're viewing these or you're viewing emergent type of procedures like this, this is why you'll oftentimes see that the patient is a little bit uncomfortable because the freezing just isn't as dependable. So I don't say this to make excuses for my emergency uh, colleagues um, who do good work, but the reality is in some cases, you really can't get good anesthetic despite putting in a ton of local anesthesia. How long would you say it takes for local anesthetic to take effect if I inject lidocaine? So if it's a 1% lidocaine with a method, yep. one, minute, one minute? Usually in one to four minutes. So this is why I'm saying it, it's almost immediate. Mm -hmm. You okay? So all I'm doing again is, is pushing and retracting on the spaces to get out as much of this as possible. So once I do that, this is sterile water. It doesn't matter that it's sterile in this case. because. And the big difference here with uh, between an abscess and an infected cyst, a cyst has a capsule. Um, a specific protein within it that actually gets infected. So usually you'll see some particulate matter that comes out with it and maybe pieces of the actual capsule. An abscess doesn't have a capsular membrane. So all we're doing is allowing the infection to drain so that the actual tissues have a chance to heal. Um, a good question with this is, do we need to put them on antibiotics afterwards? What do you think? Um, I think it depends on the size of the abscess. It actually depends on a number of factors. That's one of them. So if it's localized to one area and, and where it's at. So I'd be much more nervous with this, obviously, if it was right around the base of his neck or around his head, you know, close to his brain, like those type of things. Mm -hmm. um, and also the patient. If he was immunocompromised, you'd be pushed towards it. Studies do show that when you actually put them on an antibiotic, there is a mild benefit, so there's less likelihood of recurrence. But that can be relatively small. If the patient is entirely healthy, the majority of the time, I won't put them on antibiotics. I'll actually monitor it. Mm -hmm. Now, in this particular case, this patient has underlying diabetes, which by its nature creates a vasculopathic sort of presentation, some degree of immunocompromising, so I would certainly use one in this case. And that may affect to a certain extent, you know, which bacteria types we're looking at. So once you look at, when you look at cellulitis, which this is a sub-branch of, um, the types you'll see most commonly is what you alluded to, which is the staph aureus and strep models. Mm -hmm. But if you include diabetics, what starts to creep in? Like, you know what organism in particular we look for in diabetics? Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas, very good. Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, do you want to grab a few more four by fours? Oh, thank you. And so then you would want to be covering for that because that is actually a gram negative. So in the whole point why we remember, now is it important for med students and residents to, under, to remember gram staining and a peptidoglycan layer and crystal violet? Absolutely not. Like, you know, the reality is that's just more trivia than it is anything else. But what I do want you to remember is gram staining, gram positive bacteria and what covers them the best in terms of our antibiotic choices and that's what's most important. Mm -hmm. So here you can see that that's a lot cleaner. So the issue here being is, do we have to pack these? 10 years ago, we would pack these with ribbon gauze and we'd pack them daily until they healed. Nowadays, studies show that that just is more uncomfortable for the patient. So I'm not gonna pack this. Um, the only other reason we do it too is if we can't achieve hemostasis. So that means if it's just bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. So this is not too bad. If I leave it alone, it's just pooling a little bit. So we're gonna put a pressure dressing on this and then otherwise I'm gonna put them on an antibiotic and we'll see him back tomorrow.